Are we on and live and everything? We are live. This is the free online session, The Missing Piece, Beethoven. And um, I'm Paul Bass, and I am here with Professor Carroll. They have allowed me to join them, and I hope that you are joining us right now, coming in. And if you see the, uh, the text on your side of your screen there, go ahead and give us some questions. Go ahead and respond, ask questions as well. But I'm going to now hand it over to Professor Carroll to talk about Beethoven. Hello, Professor Carroll. Well, hello. Um, welcome to everybody. Um, it's lovely to be together on what is certainly almost wherever you are bound to be a cold, cold day. Uh, it's, it, we, we're amazed by what we're reading about the weather. I don't think it would bother Beethoven too much because he came from a much colder climate, but uh, we certainly are having an exciting time of it. So I hope you're in a warm spot now. Uh, the Missing Piece is a series we're starting to look at some of the great figures in Western culture that are, we, that are household names, basically. Um, certainly. I think it's fair to say that of the composers, there's several that m anybody kind of has heard of, and Beethoven's got to be almost number one. You could argue whether it's Mozart or, but you know, Beethoven, there you go. It's a name people recognize, and it's an image people recognize. So we're going to try to look at some of the things that are famous about these famous people, but maybe not quite what we think they are. That's sort of the premise of the missing piece. We want to fill in that missing piece. Um, and so I'm going to actually hit what I hope is the button that brings up some images. And Paul, you're going to tell me questions audibly. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. I have a few questions I want to ask you. And so uh, as you know, as you go through, I will do my best. Okay. Okay. We're getting some help here getting the slides up. There we go. Except I'm going to go back to the. Oops, we're not at the beginning. So I think I can bring it back up to the beginning. I hope no. Okay, I, so. yeah. I just did. Now we even have a title slide. There you uh, are. Very, very good. Okay, very good. Uh, the missing piece. So, um, if we think about this business about, I see, I'm trying to get my little slides to move now, left and right. Ah, left and right. I, one of the things I thought we could talk about is this idea of the image of Beethoven. I'm get, you know, it's funny, we do all these different kinds of webinars, and sometimes it's up and down, and sometimes it's left and right, so I think we're good now. Beethoven also would have very little sympathy with this problem, I think. But, <laughs> you know, this is this is how I think most people would recognize Beethoven. Is that a, I mean, does that seem familiar image to you, Paul? I don't know. Does it that, is. It is. And did he really look like that? Well, you know, <laughs> we'll never know for sure, right? Uh, what strikes you about? I mean, I could ask you. I could everybody out there. What really strikes you uh, about that image when you see it? Is well, there anything in, right up front? For, for me, of course, there's obvious reasons. But what strikes me always is is the hair. The hair. Yeah, it, it's big, and it's <laughs> you know, and it's um, usually kind of kind of puffy, and you know, it's wavy, and you know, I just that's that's it's got that um, that look to it. You know, Michael Landon. Okay. Well, and that's an image our younger viewers wouldn't quite know, but but I agree <laughs> with you on that, and everybody has a version of it. What else strikes you? I think about that. And, and maybe some of the viewers, I get, I'm going to have to rely on Paul to, to translate this to me for right now, but uh, what else sort of knocks us in the face that makes us know this is Beethoven, this has got to be Beethoven? Well, Anybody putting any input in? I, I'm not seeing any, any chat just okay, yet. Okay, well, we'll get everybody in a chat mood. Um, is this a well-kempt Beethoven? Is this a Beethoven who's carefully dressed to appear before the count uh, and petition the possibility of a commission that will allow Beethoven to pay the next three months' rent? Do you see that in there? Hmm. <laughs> or do you see a guy bursting in the door saying, "I am the genius, and I, and and you know I am writing this music, and I, and this is the power I am bringing." Does does that seem a little more like it in that image, or is that reading too much into it? No, it, that that one right there, I'm going with that. It, it looks like he's got that artist look to him, and and the the intensity in his face. Okay, I'm so glad you said that. If anybody else out there is saying that, that artist look. Now, see, we when I say that, that artist look, almost everybody in our culture, modern culture, will know what that is. I mean, we can get 50 different variations on it. So here's one of the missing pieces. Where did we get the idea of the artist look? I can tell you one thing. If he had shown up at court uh, in his, say, middle of his career with his collar like that um, and 
and that look of almost it's almost a look of defiance, a look of power. And you know, this would have been a problem. Let's look at some more images of Beethoven. Okay, let's see what happens when we go to this. Now you know this is Beethoven, but what about the guy on the left? And okay. of course, you're going to guess that it's Beethoven. Does that what does that strike you? How does that strike anybody? Well, for me, it is not it actually. They're not looking like the same guy, you know, in a, in some respects. Um, but that would just be, you know, that would just be the hair. The With the hair, he's yeah. a little better uh, put together, and of course, it's earlier, but not by much. And right. of course, these are portraits. And one of the great things about earlier periods is we don't really know. We have, if we're lucky, we have multiple images. There's an awful lot of famous people. We have only one or two portraits. And so one of the missing links always with historical figures, whether it's Thomas Jefferson, whether it's Goethe, whether it's uh, Napoleon, whether it's anybody, you know, Paul Charlemagne, is that in many cases, like we don't even have any images of some of these people. So we get our image based on other things. Let's look at some more images. How okay. about that? Okay, let me let me just make, if I may, real quick, yes. just anyone who's on with us right now, go ahead and if you have a chat box to your right or to your left of the screen, go ahead and uh, and submit your questions, submit your your comments as well. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Yes. Um, All right. What about that? Would you think that was Beethoven walking down the street at age 31? I would not. Yeah. And, and certainly much more presentable for what he might need to do. Look, again, the, the key is always the neckwear. I mean, I hope the ladies are laughing. But, you know, look at our modern era and men's neckwear. Of course, men still put on suits and still go to, you know, need to dress up. But overall, if you take, if you just grabbed up 75 people out somewhere, what would you see in terms of neckwear these days? Neckwear tells a lot of cultural history in the Western culture. Uh, in men's neckwear, okay, I mean, ladies' collars can tell a history, too. But the men's neckwear is critical in understanding a lot of phases of cultural history. Let's look at some more images. Again, we're lucky to have this many. Beethoven was born in 1770. Here he is, 33. And again, tying those things was no easy uh, trick. And, of course, we see something quite different in this. And we don't have time in just a hangout to think about who painted, under what circumstances, for whom. Not everybody got a portrait painted. Think that. Think that, too. It's not like snapping yeah. a picture on your cell phone. Okay? okay. Here he is. Now, it, another one. it's elaborate, and it's, and it's like all the way up to the, the chin. I mean, yes. every bit of neck is covered in, in both of the last two pictures. Yes. Look at this, too. You don't want to wear that to work, huh? <laughs> no. I, I, would, I would think that if I saw somebody like that right now, I would think that they were in a, a little fender bender recently. <laughs> right. I think when you were an artist in Beethoven's era, you were constantly feeling as if you were. Because, you see, we have to remember one of the things about Beethoven, and this is part of this image. The image we have of Beethoven has developed through the very end of his life and since then. Beethoven mm. would be shocked to know how he has fared in popularity and how we perceive him today. His concerns of were survival. He is, he is existing as an artist at a time where people are losing the comfort of being well employed and solidly employed, hopefully, as court composers, theater composers, cathedral composers. That was the story of life in Mozart's period. And this will be true for all artists. You know, there was, it's not that suddenly the money had completely dried up, but there is a new era of patronage in the 19th century. And you have to please in a different way. And it won't be many more years after Beethoven that you have to figure out how to organize your own concerts, get your own tickets printed, hire your own musicians, print your own programs to be able to have a concert. All of that would have been foreign to a composer in, in Haydn's day or Bach's day. Those, you know, there were some concerns, logistical. But this image, so I want to keep, make sure we get to every, the, the three missing pieces I want to talk about today. Let's go through a few more of these things. Now we're picking up an older Beethoven, hmm. a little more hair. Again, that very, very formal cravat. And again, we'd have to ask a question about each painting, why, by whom. Uh, okay, okay. Um, and now, again, you're seeing it a little bit of a change. This artistic image, of course, he's older. He's better known. His works have been, in many ways, more successful. He's in a very puzzling period, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And now we're hitting a 19th century bust. Um, past, past, in, past his lifetime, you see, where we now, oh, this is our Beethoven, right? This is Beethoven. We know that we've decided he was based on his music and the impact it had on the next generation, the next generation, the next generation, all the way down to us today. You ready no. for the wildest one, Paul? 
Okay, sure. There it is. Max Klinger's monumental, <laughs> mythological Grecian godlike, if you will, yeah. um, statue, which is in Leipzig, which was done for a very important exhibit that involved uh, the what they call the Vienna Secessionists and this incredibly, uh, many of you know the work of Gustav Klimt, for example. We don't have time to go into all that, although I'd love to do it. And we do that in our courses, by the way. We, we get into these issues. We look at the painters. We look at the poets. We look at the politics, everything we can think about uh, that would have involved this. But you see, now we have an Olympian deity, practically. Beethoven, if he'd walked by this, would have, and saw his name on it, what do you think he would have done? Uh, you know, I, I can't even imagine what he would have done. He, right. he might have said... I don't know if he would recognize it as himself, that's for sure. And, and he might have wondered how he got up there and where was his shirt, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, now, there is a wonderful book, and, you know, we're going to be putting a website uh, on our professorcarol.com for the... <coughs> Excuse me for the Missing Link series, and I will post there something to a book by Alessandra Comini, who is a professor emeritus at SMU at Southern Methodist University, one of the great art historians, lovers of music and music history of our time, who's been very influential in Viennese art and also in music and art over many, many decades. I mean, she's, she's just, an, I can't even begin to tell you, but she did this book called The Changing Image of Beethoven. <coughs> I'm so sorry. I get a little excited. A study in myth making. And she literally takes the times, the places, the portraits, the physical descriptions people left in letters, and she looks at how as Beethoven's music went from being a symphony, a great symphony, to a force of creativity. How did the image grow and grow till you finally get to something like this at the dawn of the twentieth century? So well, like, we yeah, do have we do have a couple questions. Please, let's hear them. Yeah, well, Catherine asks, you know, in, in so many of the pictures, even though his hair changed, it looks like he never combs it. She says, <laughs> why is that? Well, you know, we, he did have a reputation of being somewhat unkempt, especially later in life. We've got to remember that Beethoven never married. He had many... And again, there's a lot of wonderful things you can read about this, and if people are really interested, I can, I can post some of this. He had many changes of address. Let's just put it that way. Mm -hmm. He was um, slow to pay his rent. Sometimes he didn't have the money. Sometimes he simply forgot. People who came to visit him were kind of distraught at the condition of everything, and we don't have to go into the details there, okay? And there wasn't a Mrs. Beethoven saying, Ludwig, you haven't done your cravat correctly. You know, there, he was a... He was... Okay, was he, or you know, or is he indeed? When we look back on him, his personal habits, his isolation, his his intensity, which many artists have, but was he, in a nutshell, the person that launched for us this image of the artist, certainly through music, and gave permission to even to today for artists to be a little crazy, a little extravagant a little inexplicable, a little uh, pink hair and green hair and purple hair. You know, is he one of those missing pieces that open an image after his life for artists to, to have a, a different set of rules, in a way, to function mm. in society? Well, Amanda, she asks something that I believe you're going to touch on uh, in Missing Piece number three, but she talks about the, a very determined... Uh, look in his eyes in the in the photos. Okay, well, can we hold on to that because she's exactly right. And and of course, when did painters would they have painted uh, an artist in 1720 or in 1750 with that same look? So much of what we get from the image depends on what was the popular style of painting. We look back, we see old paintings, right? That, but these were cutting edge portraits, almost like fashion shows. If I mean, not not in Beethoven sense, but think about it. You know, everybody wants to see the new style, and artists were constantly painting in the new, or t many of them in the newest style. So painting these people with that look was very trendy in the 19th century. It might, you know, you wouldn't have done it in in a Renaissance portrait, right? 
But right. suddenly when you get to 1800, 1790, 1820s, 30s, 40s, we have that whole Byronic, you know, from Lord Byron, the poet, mm -hmm. we have, and from Pushkin, and from the, the late works of, you know, the, the, at least the way people look back at Goethe and Schiller. We've got this idea of this unleashed genius that can have that look in his eyes. and In fact, needs to have that look in his eyes, whether he ever did or not. <laughs> Well, what do you have next for us? Let's go. Let's see what we have. Oops, I just went back to the beginning somehow. Uh, that, that just was in there. Let's really? talk about the, the missing piece I think that people associate, and I think it's fair to say most people, if they know the name Beethoven, they've probably heard that he was deaf, right? Does that right. seem fair? Uh, yeah, I believe everybody wants to, to know about that, yes. Well, and there are many very detailed articles, again, I can list some on the website that talk about what they believe was his real medical condition. Mm. Uh, not a lot was known, and there were certainly no cures. The best people had to offer were those metal ear trumpets. I'm sure you've seen them. They look like something somebody worked out in a high school shop, you know. The ear trumpets, which are horribly awkward, and of course said to the whole room, I'm deaf, I can't hear you. And... Uh, going for the cure, going to the baths. I won't take the time now to talk about that, but this is the hot springs. We think about it as going to the spas. You know, you would take the mineral baths. They were, they're all over Europe. They're in what we would call today's Germany and today's Czech Republic. And um, throughout that whole part of Europe, you've got these mineral baths and mineral springs. And they were the answer to everything from rheumatism to, um, well, you know, emotional problems to, you know, allergies, what we might say today, to, uh, I mean, you name it. Everybody took the cure and hoped that these mineral baths would fix it. And that was one of the things that Beethoven did often to try to help his deafness. Uh, I think you can guess it didn't help. Mm. Okay. So what is it that people think? And people, again, let me know what people are writing, uh, if they are. But uh, what, why do people think the deafness is so interesting, Paul? Why do you think it's interesting? Well, because he's dealing in a, a medium uh, which needs audible, and you need to hear. Um, okay. You're going to make something you're going to want to hear what you've made. Okay, and that's what I was kind of hoping you might say. <laughs> How about that? Um, you know, that's what we think. You have to hear to compose. And I think people... Okay, do you have to hear to make up a or to, to hear a song inside your mind? And this is the missing piece, too. Uh, number two, that the way most composers work, not all, but most, it, it happens in their inner ear. We might say inside your head in a modern way of saying, in your mind. And to prove that to yourself, you know, how easy is it for everybody out there just to listen inside your head and hear 25 songs, one song. Hear your, maybe your mother's voice singing a, a lullaby to you, if you will. Or say, uh, to hear, uh, th th think of the first, I want to hold your hand, or Peter, Paul, and Mary, or, or the voice of anything that you might have grown up with. How about a tune that you know your child's been singing, you know, the Itsy Bitsy Spider. Can we all do the Itsy Bitsy Spider inside of our head <laughs> easily, right? Easily. Um, yeah, until and it's almost. Have you ever had a tune? I call them earworms that are stuck in your head. You can't even get it out. My my point being that that's where most composers work on their music. Now they verify, and some composers are more tactile. Stravinsky liked to be at the piano and really feel it physically through his hand, even though he's writing for orchestra. So there are things like the piano hearing instrument helps, but the actual mental and artistic process happens inside and it's not dependent on the human ear. That's a fact. You know, it's on paper. It's part of it's intellectual. Part of it is knowing the rules of harmony, knowing mm -hmm. especially in that period. It is not dependent on what goes through the eardrum. Now and, and, did it and, did it cause him problems though? Well that's it. Well that's it. It did cause two specific kinds of problems. Okay. And 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 these are the most important. I mean you could add to this of course. And, and I want to say, if we have time, I'll say a word about Beethoven's sketches, because that's one of the, you talk about a missing piece we have for most great artists. We don't know their creative process. We don't know, okay, when they woke up and at 10 o'clock on such a day or in the morning, they started this idea, and then that evening, X'd it out, and went to this idea, and oh, then this whole thing went on the floor, and then something else, oh, and then three months later. Well, we know a lot of that with Beethoven. We know because of the sketchbooks, and I'll just dangle that right now. But let me tell you about the two problems that it definitely caused. It. And I think this is where we need to focus when we tell our children about, well, Beethoven was deaf. The first one is that he, and you said it earlier, Paul, he couldn't hear to confirm as, as in his later life. And it starts about 1801, 1802. I mean, he's only in his 30s, early 30s. And it gets worse, and by 1818, he's stone deaf, okay, as they say. He couldn't 
when he put something in front of an orchestra he, and he couldn't confirm that the balance between the oboes and the horns was good or that there were too many or not enough of, of the viola or he couldn't confirm the live performance and he couldn't confirm all of the balance in the orchestration. Does that make sense? So he lost the art of confirmation of mm -hmm. what he had put on paper and this is a definitely a professional handicap. Okay. Now, now what about uh, was the amount of work that he did before and after did it did it ramp up or did it slow down? Well, he was very he was what we call prolific. I love that word. That's a good one. If you're looking for vocabulary, everybody, for your kids, prolific is a very helpful word. Uh, out came a lot of creative works, and, and most of them were fairly amazing. You know, hundreds, and. His ability to compose kind of depended on how he was feeling about things and where he was and how focused, as it is with most of us. You know, there were years that were fallow, and there, there were years like in the mid period where he's writing the violin concerto, the fourth and fifth symphony, some of the most important piano sonatas, the Opus 59 string quartets. Uh, I could go, uh, you know, it's just going boom, 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 boom. And that was after he had just had a tremendous disappointment when a cure that he hoped would happen at a place called Heiligen City, Healing City, Heiligenstadt. And he had gone and he really was hopeful that it was going to help, and it didn't help. And he was in this terrible state, and yet, bing, out it came. So um, it, then he has fallow years in the t 18 teens, and then he's back creative in the late years, writing things like the Ninth Sym Symphony and those late piano sonatas and string quartets that people are still in awe of. So it's up and down, but the deafness sometimes put him in a bad mood or a good mood, or, but family thinks his brothers, his interaction with a guardianship, that's a real mess. I mean, you want to read a wild story. But here's the thing. Um, so it, it kind of wasn't an issue of deafness. It might have been a response to how he was feeling, but not, oh, I'm more deaf, therefore I can't write, because his late years are his most extraordinary. He couldn't hear a thing. Okay. But I, I want to tell you the second thing that's really important for us to keep in mind about his deafness. It made him socially, but first of all, awkward and timid. I mean, I, I don't want to, I don't have a whole lot of time to read some of this, although it is so, so fun to read what Beethoven wrote, because he wrote so much cool stuff. I love my Beethoven books. I hope everybody has a good Beethoven book. But he writes, for example, here, and I think this is about 1801. Yes, he's writing. He says, it, he's, he's, he's nervous. He, he doesn't want anyone to find out. He said, if I had any other profession, I might be able to cope with my infirmity. But in my profession, it is a terrible handicap. And listen to what he says next. If my enemies, of whom I have a fair number, and he means competitors, you know, in that respect as well, were to hear about it, what would they say? You see, and how do you appear before Count and please him with who you are and get commissions? How do you prefer, pr appear before the, the Duke? How do you go out into society? How do you join? And being social in Vienna was terribly important. We are not in 1920. We're in 18, you know, 5 and 10. And we've got, he had, he, when he came to Vienna after 1792, he had to become not, he had to become socially successful. And that's hard to do if you don't have a good family. He didn't have a lot of money. He didn't have the best clothes. He didn't comb his hair enough, like you said. And ha suddenly he's not able to sit at a dinner party and chat, which he hated all that stuff, by the way. But most artists don't like it, but they do it. He couldn't interact socially, and he couldn't hide the deafness at a certain point from what he would say in this letter, my enemies, people who, who were not his supporters. He could be mocked for it. He could be you know, seen as incompetent for it. So it was that kind of a professional handicap. Well, um, Catherine states that she believes that his music is so interesting because it did originate out of his uh, his deafness, some of it, and out of his head. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. It frees you up. If what you're responding to now is no longer what was what you heard at some party or some concert two weeks ago or what somebody has said to you they expect you suddenly have a world where you're 100 percent able to respond to what you hear inside and for artists like Beethoven or many artists then that means you are up and running and you right. you know it's an open playing field it's sort of like playing football and there's no defenders you know you just run it down the field and that's what he did in his late works he possibly wrote more he focused heard. Pardon? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, so many things he hoped might happen in his life didn't. Mm. And when you get in those late years and you have that kind of creativity, what you're going to do is pour it all out on the page because you're not, you, I mean, you want performances, you need to pay the rent, you need to be able to hire musicians, you need income. But you, so many things you might have envisioned are no longer going to happen, so he just went for it. Mm. You mentioned a good 
uh, Beethoven book, what, what would your recommendation be? Well, if you want to study his image, then I would go for The Changing Image of Beethoven by Alessandra, A-L-E-S-S-A-N-D-R-A, -S 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 Comini, C-O-M-I-N-I. It's available in a new edition, as, if I'm not mistaken, and you find used copies as well. She's just extraordinary because she's going to look at the art. She's going to look at the fashion. It's not a music book. It's a book about how culture since Beethoven's death in 1827, and even before it, looked at those images such as we were just looking at and really why they developed to the point where you get that Max Klinger in 1902 and Beethoven has become like Zeus. She takes him from this guy who wanders into Vienna in 1792 and, and not really ready in some respects for what he has to do in the big city, you know, coming from Bonn, which was smaller, and, and she takes him from that point, and, and, and then she really, you know, it's marvelous. You just love that book. Mm. It's, she's, so should we get to point three or should we take some more questions? Let's go, let's go on to point three. Um, I will, I'll bring up the questions as I find them okay. on here. But we do want to know about the, that intensity of emotion yeah. and his music and how it played out in the music. And, and I think that's a, one of the most interesting points, and I believe someone earlier was asking about it. Uh, this, and, of course, we can't do this without listening. I mean, ideally, we sit, we listen. How much emotion is too much? What is the role of emotion in music? All of these things. We think it's terribly important in our day to be very emotional and to have things touch us and move us and stormy and, st and there's actually a movement in the in the 18th century called Sturm und Drang, Storm and Stress. It was a literary movement where the emotions and ro rocking those emotions became more important than other literary aspects of a, of a work. And Beethoven sort of brought up in that. That was kind of his, you might say his teens and twenties and reading some of that literature. Um, we think this is the height of musical creativity, but if you back up into other eras of, of time in the arts, it wouldn't have been the height. It would be one aspect. Lost in Beethoven's time, left behind, because mu music was changing, the arts were changing, were things like balance and symmetry and restraint and categorizing the information. This was Mozart's world. This was, to a certain degree, back up further, Vivaldi and Bach's world, absolutely, the Baroque, where we have something called the doctrine of the affections, go all the way back to what Plato said about music, you know, talking about how music had to be handled very carefully because it was very powerful, and you shouldn't mix up those emotions. You, a soldier shouldn't listen to this music in this kind of a key the night before a battle because he will lose his will to be strong and brave. You know, throughout our Western cultural history, there's been a strong understanding of the role of emotion in music, but it's never been thought to be a good idea to unleash it totally and let it run rampant. That's a 19th century idea, and I think we know it led to a lot of crazy things. So, um, you know, Beethoven, when we look back at it, and we look at his turmoil, and we, because we have his sketchbooks, because we see the creative process, many other things, something called the conversation books, which are fascinating. One side of the conversations with him from about 1818 on with many, many people. So we know what they said to him. We can trace the most mundane, did the potatoes get here, from the potato man, to the most intense conversations that he would have had, where they would write what they said to him, and he would speak his answers. We have so much knowledge of Beethoven's inner soul, his inner workings, his creative process that we can look back and we listen to the music and we, we sprinkle all that in and then we think yes yes what was driving him always was emotion but you know what and there's not time to go into this without listening to a lot of music we'll do this at other points in our classes but he was also driven by form by considerations of harmonic progression by considerations of what we call counterpoint and texture he was thinking on many many tracks emotion was one of them not necessarily the most important, even though we look back and see it differently. Does that make some sense? Yeah, so order helps it, you know, keep it together. You can't have the emotion without some form of order to put it together. Is that, well, would that be right. fair? Well, right, and the forms and reason Beethoven's music has seemed to have opened up the whole 19th century is he took very well-established classical forms. If you have a child taking piano lessons and they're playing a little da 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 bum ba da 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 little sonatinas and things, those are classical forms. They're forms just like baking forms are. They have shapes. Things happen in the first section musically and harmonically and melodically. Things happen in the next section. Things happen in the third section. Expand that to make it 10 minutes long, 20 minutes long, 30 minutes long. Beethoven 
knew all of that, and he's always working in forms. The next generation is going to blow a lot of that up, but Beethoven is still writing quartets, sonatas, symphonies, themes and variations. He's working in fixed forms that Mozart would have known, that composers for centuries, well, I'm sorry, decades, I should say, decades should have, would have known, and centuries, actually. And he is sticking with those forms, but he is kind of making little explosions in the midst of them and stretching them and making them become something that is, because inside he is doing all that. The next generation and the ones after him will look back and say, look what he did, and now we can go with it. That was that was what I was going to ask. Do you yourself, when you are um, going about listening to music, so to speak, can can you tell Beethoven's impact? You mean after his death, or after yes. his? In yes, today. I mean, can you can you tell me? I know this is just off the cuff, and uh, you know I haven't given you any warning to research this or anything. No. But, we shouldn't need you know. to do that on the Hangout, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, what are there examples where you can see, okay, they were definitely influenced by uh, Beethoven. And just going forward from Beethoven, his, his legacy. Well, the next generation will really create some much more open forms that, that are based more on emotion and what we call text painting, storytelling through music, we call it the tone poem. Uh, composers like Berlioz, and by the way, anybody who's taking Discovering Music with us, you're getting now into Unit 12, uh, you'll be getting into some of that and, and after Unit 12 as well, also Unit 17, um, in case you're doing, you know, we've got to keep our students going on the right spots here, but um, it, something that is the direct ancestor of what we would call the film score today where suddenly it's not going to be sonata number 26 opus da, 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 or quartet number three or it's going to be a tone poem also Sprach Zarathustra, that's a little bit later, or Herald in Italy, or Symphony Fantastique, which in, in many ways still is quite structured but still, or uh, Hamlet or Tasso poems that List wrote, tone poems, these were stories in music that used a lot of the classical principles but didn't require the music to go in the same orders with the same rules and the same expectation. Instead, the story was driving what was written down. And that is the absolute direct ancestor of what in the next century will become the movie, the movie music. Wow. So See, that's one thing. Now you got me. Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> I mean, of course, and also the idea that Beethoven worked in modas. Da 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 da, da da da, bum ba da 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 da, which is more like a melody. Um, bum 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 ba da 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 dum, bum 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 bum. If you're talking about the eroica third movement or last movement, I mean, we can go through the Beethoven, the middle Beethoven, the late Beethoven, and we're hearing these fragments of melodies, little. They're almost like patterns. They're not long, flowing melodies. They're patterns, and they're punchy. And they can be they can be added to. They can be chopped up. They can be intensified. They can be made faster. They can be made bigger. And he's and, and if you go back to really what ultimately would be Wagner, and then leading again to the uh, the open music of the 20th century and the film music, we think of your movie music. It has these little motives. They're called that convey emotion. And a lot of that traces they, to Beethoven, and he wasn't the only one, but he's our guy, okay? That was a lot to say in one sentence, wasn't it? Yeah. But, you know, it's exciting stuff. He, again, would be floored, I think, to see the influence he had. Wow. Well, you have some questions? I, let's see. Um, just comments. You know, Heather says, fascinating. She finds it, it fascinating, and, and I, have to, I have to agree, and... You know, that's what I like about you, Professor Carroll, is that I'm a guy who, well, I took the bare minimals as far as music, but when you, personally, when you tie it into the history, and you like you did today, and you tied it into film scores, I'm, you know, I love movies. Um, yeah, I know you do. <laughs> I know the, that about you. Yeah, well, all of a sudden, we I... All do. I'm a Beethoven fan, or I'm, you know, I'm a, I am a classical music fan where I didn't really know that I was previously. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, and um, so I appreciate that about you, about your courses, and. Um, oh, look there! <laughs> yeah. Can we take a look at that while, in case people are uh, not familiar with what we do. That Absolutely. That's our. That's the one I was referring to before. If you are taking discovering music, either in the uh, physical form. 
or the online form, Unit 12 is when we get into the, the creations of the Tone Poem Franz list, the generation after Beethoven, working in what is called the shadow of Beethoven. That's a, isn't that a nice term, the shadow of Beethoven? It's a shadow because people aren't exactly sure what, well, they were sure what to do. Hmm. Well, and if you can, I mean, just tell us, you know, what what would a person, how does a person get this? And I, I, I know that it may sound like a commercial, but I've seen the product, and I want to, I want you to have time to talk about it a little more. How somebody could get this course, and what else you're doing online? What other courses are you teaching? Did I lose you? I'm going to have to have you. There you are. That that got a little lost somewhere in the technology between where you are. Can you say it again, please? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I. Well, you have your slide up there. I want now I hear to you. be able to talk about the other courses that you have available on professorcarol.com. Yes. Well, there they are, and we are just now in this very week opening early sacred music, and I'm so excited about that. We've been working on that for two and a half years. We had some great blessings that allowed us to film in Jerusalem, uh, and that sort of started everything off. We had the idea, and once that came about, that opportunity, we just said, let's do it. And, and now, two and a half years later, it's starting, and our first uh, live class will be on 3rd of February. I believe, uh, I'm trying to remember the time, I won't tell you it wrong, but it's on our website under that course. And we will have the study materials up in just a day or so. Uh, there'll be videos, there'll be video instruction, there'll be uh, assignments, there'll be things to read to get us all ready for that first class. We'll go all the way back to the first temple of Jerusalem and we will go through medieval period in this course. It's a 12-week course and as I say it's just about to start. Um, and we also have our second semester of America's Artistic Legacy where we're starting right around the years before the First World War. We'll be starting about 1880 basically and going on up in our second semester. The first semester is available for those who maybe didn't get in on it. You can go back and start the first semester. You can jump right in the second semester with us and then pick the first semester up later because it's all exciting and it's not dependent on having done the first semester. Our Imperial Russia course is there at any point anybody wants to have it. Uh, it's a wonderful course. It's a very, very, very colorful course. Oh, I like it very much. And we have seminars and sessions on research and writing and, of course, our big signature course, Discovering Music, and a program that you know well, Paul, Exploring America's Musical Heritage. And we're adding more things all the time. So uh, that's the basic things about being in the circle of scholars. Very good. Well, thank you Oops. so much. Well, uh, thank you so much. Do we have? I'm trying to get back to a little. Uh, I guess I didn't yeah. have a closing slide. We should have had Beethoven's picture in there instead of the nice, uh, the nice Russian Tsar. And were there any more comments that we wanted to share? Anybody? Well, um, Teeny, she says emotion was a big part of that era, and Beethoven used emotion a lot with his music. It's very inspirational sure. to people of our time. She just made that comment. Well, it is, and you know, when we think back about it, um, think about the first time you ever heard it. Uh, how did it affect you? Can you even remember? Uh, what was it? Was it live or on a recording? I mean, it's hard. Sometimes I think it seems like we've known Beethoven since we were kids, you know, and yet it's not children's music, and we're not exposed to it usually as little children. Some people are. Um, I would say, if you're asking how do I work with Beethoven, I would find one piece and let it become extremely familiar. And that mm -hmm. might be one of the symphonies. People always pick the fifth, but it might be something like the fourth or the sixth or the first symphony is, you know, a little, uh, maybe if you're not as familiar with it. Sometimes when we're familiar, uh, we're uh, too, it's too hackneyed. You know, we hear da 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 and we just go, oh, that's Beethoven. But <laughs> we hear it. And then it's great stuff. Why is that Beethoven? You know, or you might. I love, I love the concertos, the first, the five piano concerti that he finished, and the violin concerto. Oh my gosh! If somebody wants a piece just to become what I call the kitchen piece, the thing you have on your CD player, your tape player. Some people still use tape players. I, I do sometimes. If you've never heard Beethoven's violin concerto, oh, it is so inspiring. And there's a melody. Da, 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 and you know he wasn't always the great melodist like Mozart or Brahms or or George Gershwin. You know he wasn't really a melodist, but he had, when he gets a good one. And the thing that's so beautiful about that piece is the orchestra's playing it, and at the very end of that movement, finally the violin soars with it. It is so beautiful. The, it's Opus 61. He only wrote one violin concerto. 
So if you're trying to sort of do something fresh and new, but it's still Beethoven, it's good solid Beethoven, and I just cannot recommend highly enough falling in love with the Beethoven Violin Concerto. I think it's going to be a, a, a beautiful thing for your heart and your soul. Okay. Well, I, ha I do have a question. We do have a couple comments. Uh, Catherine, Amanda as well, both of them uh, saying thank you and thank you for sharing your insight. And um, Thank you for coming and joining us. Yes, thank you everyone. I, I did want a question here. Being a guy like myself who just basically watches movies and gets his music from the movies, but I, you know, how do I trust the recording of, you know, if I'm going to look up uh, Beethoven's fourth symphony, symphony, what, how do I trust the recording? I need, I need someone who's going to portray it in a, a realistic way. Mm, you know that there's so much available now. I to me, and again, I'm not a kind of record. When I was a student, I bought what was affordable. <laughs> you know, if there was a used one or something that was on sale, that's what I got because I couldn't do the fancy ones, even though my colleagues, some of them did. There are people who are connoisseurs, and they get on, especially on the internet. You could debate till two in the morning with people about the best recording of this or that. But I tell you what, I think matters. Um, there's not that many bad ones that you're going to find. I, and I, I, that's a, maybe a silly thing to say. I'm sure you can find some bad ones. But it is possible now to listen. You can go to iTunes and listen to parts of many different ones without having chosen to buy anything yet. And you can see which one kind of catches you in sound. Um, you may fall in love with a certain performer like, uh, performer like Joshua Bell, and you want to hear everything he recorded. That's a nice way to go about it. You love Renee Fleming. You want to hear anything she sang because it's just great. Or Dmitry Fordostovsky, you just want to look at him. He's so great, you know. And, and so I think you can find an angle. Don't don't feel intimidated by, oh, it's got to be the most important recording. You can do a little reading and find out that someone like Karyon, one of the great conductors, German uh, conductors, was a specialist in certain types of music. So maybe it's good to listen to some of that. But I think the pieces speak through whatever recording. You're going to fall in love with those melodies. That you're going to love those harmonies, that tension, that excitement. And then once you know the piece, you're in a better position, Paul, I think to make decisions about what recording you like. Well, what about you making decisions on a favorite? Do do you are there so many out there that you don't have a favorite or can you say that one thing is your favorite Beethoven piece? Oh, you mean that single piece? Yes. Uh, you know what? I love that violin concerto. I'm sorry. Even though I didn't learn it till very late in life, uh, not quite very late in life, as a grad student, late in my graduate work, I didn't even know. I was, I was a pianist. I played all the Beethoven piano, not all, but many of the piano sonatas. I assumed they were the, and the concerto. I love the concertos. I think the Beethoven fourth piano concerto, fifth piano concerto, all of them, even the first. If you, if, if, you know, piano sonatas are more austere. They're a little more intellectual. I don't mean that as an off-putting thing, but you know, it is one instrument, one sound, one, it's almost like reading a very intense uh, cerebral book sometimes, you know. And whereas a concerto is a dialogue, it's a drama. Piano, orchestra, piano, orchestra, go, 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 you know. And, and, and so I think the concertos are great ways to get the kids in it. And you can watch this stuff on YouTube now. You can see incredible performances of some of the greatest artists by clicking the button. Oh, I wish I could have done that as a student. So, but if you just want to do something and, and you want something gorgeous, I think you might love that violin concerto. I really think you might. Wow. I'm going to stick with that today. That's my recommendation. That's my menu of the day, okay? Good. Good. Very good. Well, thank you again, Professor Carroll. Uh, this has oh, been a great you. time. You. you have inspired me, and I'm sure those of us who've been watching have been inspired to go listen to some of those pieces right now. Well, good. Well, come join us. We're going to have another missing piece pretty soon here, and we're going to keep working through some of these greats and try to figure out what the thing is that makes us think they're great, and, and is that even a, a true thing or not, or what we can explore further in putting that whole substance of these great, truly great artists together. Right, right. As Catherine okay. states, uh, music today is so different than it was back then, and uh, so it would be a good discussion going forward to, to talk about what makes it great. Oh, that would be a good one. That would be a really good one. We can just hang out. Just let's just keep hanging out. Thank you so much for helping, Paul. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. I, I look